Okay, our panel is assembled, and we want everybody to have a chance to uh, to talk about their particular uh, technology or application. And the speakers that we're going to hear from in this session, again, it's in terms of looking at a variety of exciting uh, efficiency uh, technology work and and applications. And uh, our first speaker will be Ellen Schaefer, who is Executive Director of the Diesel Technology Forum. Ellen. Thanks very much, Carol. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just say a word about the Diesel Technology Forum for those of you not familiar. We are a nonprofit organization. We represent diesel engine and equipment manufacturers, fuel refiners, and companies that make emissions control technology. Uh, and so we are a forum, so we like to talk to folks about issues relative to diesel, whether they be clean air or energy efficiency ones. So um, let me uh, offer a few quick nuggets of information uh, to power up our, our panel discussion on energy today. Um, uh, diesel is the most energy efficient internal combustion engine out there. It converts more uh, chemical potential energy and fuel to useful mechanical energy than any other internal combustion engine. Um, so that's why diesel is really what we call the lifeblood of our global economy. Um, in the U.S., we just did a study last year, and it's available at our uh, table out in the expo area. Um, diesel contributes about $480 billion annually to the U.S. economy with a direct and significant influence on 16 super sectors from agriculture to wholesale trade and everything in between. Um, the other thing that uh, I would note from an economic point of view about diesel um, it's really a, an export powerhouse. Uh, the demand for clean diesel technology around the globe is growing, and we have the technology here in America that's, uh, that's now quite uh, uh, an envy in terms of export. About 4.4% of all exports in the U.S. were diesel engines and fuels uh, last year. That's about $46 billion on an annual basis. Uh, so uh, the final uh, point I'd make from an economic perspective is that um, based on our research in this study, um, we, we believe that the influence of diesel power is broader than electricity in the U.S. economy. That is, that it touches more activities and transactions than electricity does. And when you think about that in places that don't have uh, connection to the grid, uh, but uh, villages that might rely on using a renewable fuel-based uh, backup diesel generator, uh, you can understand why uh, diesel has such a pervasive impact. So let's talk a little bit about what makes diesel a, a key part of a sustainable and energy efficient future. Um, first of all, I mentioned the fact that it is the most energy efficient internal combustion engine. Um, but I think uh, other things that are most important are the transformation of diesel to a really clean technology. Um, how many of you have been behind a smoking bus ever in your life? Okay, we all have. But those days have diminished dramatically. The new generation of diesel technology is near zero emissions, and we are almost as clean as natural gas on NOx. Very, very close, just a few, uh, few percentage points away. Uh, so what we find is that the diesel over the last decade has transformed to a very clean, low emissions technology, but not lost any of its energy efficiency attributes. So getting to be a clean technology just gets you in the door to be a player for the future. Um, its inherent energy efficiency uh, keeps us uh, in the game, I think, for the long haul. Um, the energy density that's available in uh, diesel and renewable diesel fuels combined with the efficiency of the engine, it's really a tough combination to beat when you're talking about moving heavy loads, providing the kinds of torque and energy that you need across so many different applications of the economy. Another point that's, uh, I think, very relevant is that diesel is uh, a technology that was founded on renewable fuels. The very first diesel engine ran over 100 years ago um, on peanut oil. And uh, today we find um, an industry that is willing to accept greater use of renewable fuels, and uh, whether that's first-generation biodiesel fuels or second-generation advanced renewable fuels made from algae, from jatropha, from uh, whatever uh, source there might be, the diesel engine is going to take that and use it more efficiently. Uh, so it's a very flexible platform for renewable energy. Uh, the fourth aspect I would point out is that diesel is a widespread available technology today. So when we talk about making benefits and impacts, using, making small change in efficiency of diesel engines has huge impacts on our energy consumption nationwide. Uh, so today, right now, um, heavy-duty truck manufacturers are working towards the very first 
mandated fuel efficiency standards for medium and commercial uh, heavy-duty trucks. So uh, starting in 2014, those new trucks that are sold must be between 5 and 20 percent more energy efficient than the ones we're selling today. How is that going to happen? The diesel engine is going to get even more fuel efficient than it is right now. You'll see greater use of things like aerodynamic technologies, um, low weight, uh, less weighted materials like aluminum, uh, some other advancements uh, in the vehicle that will make overall gains in efficiency. So we can continue to use the, uh, the diesel to power the nation's trucks, but do it in a far more fuel efficient, lower CO2 and near zero emissions kind of way. So um, the last point I'd like to make is relative to diesel cars. So anybody in the room driving a diesel car right now or know folks that do? Okay. There's a couple of us. Very nice. More hands are coming up. Um, Today, diesel cars in the U.S. make up about 3% of all new vehicle sales, and that includes the heavy-duty pickup trucks, the F-250s and the big uh, General Motors and Dodge Ram heavy-duty pickup trucks that haul boats and trailers. So a very small percentage of all new vehicle sales. Contrast that with Europe, where diesels make up about 50% of all new vehicle sales. Um, so where are we going in the U.S. with diesel cars? Um, we project, um, I shouldn't say we, but others project that diesel will take up about 10 to 12 percent of all new vehicle sales by around 2020. Um, we're seeing a, a, an explosion in interest in diesel cars because of the new EPA fuel economy standards. Um, and diesels offer a great uh, option for manufacturers in terms of being able to maintain vehicle utility, performance over uh, all kinds of driving cycles. Um, and help meet these increasingly stringent CO2 and fuel efficiency uh, requirements. Next, today there are 16 models available for consumers to buy, everything from a Volkswagen Jetta and a Passat TDI uh, on up to some of the luxury German uh, vehicles from Mercedes and Audi. Um, and uh, we're, interestingly, we're finding uh, these vehicles are extremely popular in terms of their ability to win awards. Just this year, the Mercedes C-Class won the World Green Car of the Year. It beat out three full electric vehicles and 19 or so uh, hybrids of different kinds. Um, and it was voted on by a, a group of international journalists. And the reason they picked that diesel was because it's very low CO2, very fuel efficient, and brought broad benefits to a, a wide variety of folks. So um, they're looking at um, not only how interesting technologies are, but also how broadly they can be adopted and how their benefits can accrue. So. Um, with that, um, I appreciate the chance to chat with you today and, and share our story about clean diesel technology and look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Th thanks, Alan, because obviously diesel is terribly important in terms of our whole energy mix, and it's really exciting to hear about all of these huge, huge opportunities and improvements. Our next speaker is Eric Huffman, who is the Director of Daylighting Sales with Acuity Brands. And this is about the wonderful things that daylighting can do. Thanks, Carol. Good afternoon. Let me start with a special thank you to Carol and her tireless efforts uh, putting this together every year and the Environmental and Energy Study Institute and Kim Basong and, of course, the Sustainable Energy Coalition who hosts the entire event. Uh, it's, it's, I've been a part of it for about five years, and it's great to see the every time it seems like we're growing a little more, so I appreciate being a part of it. I'd like to welcome our guests, congressional members and staff. It's a privilege to be here today, as well as uh, my fellow panelists, Alan, Les, and Bruce. Uh, my name is Eric Huffman, as Carol said. I'm the director of daylighting sales for Sun Optics, an Acuity Brands company. Acuity Brands is the largest uh, manufacturer of lighting and control systems in North America, and they bought Sun Optics, a skylight company, uh, in February of last year. I'm here today not only to represent my company, but also as a concerned citizen regarding energy efficiency and the future of our co country in that direction. In the brief time I have today, I'd like to discuss energy efficiency and the benefits of utilizing daylighting and specifically top lighting as a design strategy to reduce energy consumption and how including daylighting in the direct solar initiative language would be very beneficial to energy efficiency and the economy in general. The simple definition of daylighting is a, in this context is to eliminate the need for electric light as much as possible throughout the day by harnessing that free natural light that we get from the sun. The top lighting as part of daylighting 
is when that daylighting concept is brought in through a skylight on top of the roof, as the name would imply. When properly designed, the skylight and electric lighting control system are designed into a space, the energy savings can be amazing. The United States has made great strides in energy efficiency, as explained in the handout from the SEC, if you picked one up, uh, for the event. Many of the companies represented here today have taken an active role in helping with this agenda. A few of the highlights include the economy of the United States has tripled in size since 1979, and three quarters of that energy needed to fuel that growth has come from energy efficiency measures. However, much more can still be done. The economies of Japan and several European countries are about 50% more energy efficient than the United States. Secondly, improved federal energy management over the last two decades has reduced energy use in federal buildings and other facilities has resulted in significant energy and coal, uh, cost savings as well. Energy, federal energy has decreased by 16% from 1985 to 2007. However, we believe we just scratched the surface. There's more low-hanging low fruit to be had to maximize our savings from energy efficiency. The potential energy savings and economic impact have been documented in numerous studies, including the DOE, and many other private studies that have been funded by individual energy uh, focus groups. Daylighting or top lighting is one of the most often overlooked energy efficiency strategies. The concept is so simple. Often the myth that surrounds the use of skylights for daylighting is what concerns designers and building owners and often limits implementation. How many people have a skylight in their house? How many people have a skylight that leaks in their house? <laughs> yes. That, believe it or not, that's one of the biggest hurdles that we have in seeing daylighting fully implemented in many projects and adapted as a, as a part of code and incentive packages. So you may be familiar with that concept of having a, a bright spotlight track across the floor if you have one in your house as well. And it, maybe it fades the carpet or the drapes or maybe the dog likes laying there because it's warm. But uh, that idea of daylight is, is not what we consider daylighting. That's the ambience, uh, the aesthetics of having a skylight in your house, where our focus when we properly daylight a space is to eliminate the need for electric light during the day in very large industrial, commercial, and uh, retail spaces. So when many people associate the excessive heat and UV damage and leak concerns with all skylights, it's simply not true. Sun Optics and other skylighting companies have proven that proper design layout and installation of a skylight can overcome the myths typically associated with daylighting. This is exemplified by one of our largest clients, Walmart, who has daylit over 4,000 spaces, well over a billion square feet of space, and typically turns off their electric lights an average of 2,800 hours per year per store. It's a dramatic savings. Of course, it's also been proven to increase sales a daylit store versus a non-daylit store. So when high quality skylights are properly designed in a space, the results can be amazing. This is not a new concept. You can visit many of the buildings on the National Mall, including this one, that you walked in through the rotunda. If you looked up, you'll see a big skylight on top of the roof. Top lighting and daylighting is not a new idea. It just has, has been ignored for so long. Since the beginning of time, the pure natural light from the sun has been utilized to light buildings, interiors. In only recent history, we began to heavily use electric lighting and move away from the natural sunlight. However, even Thomas Edison himself said, and I quote, we are like tenant farmers chopping down the fence around our houses for fuel when we should be using nature's inexhaustible resources of sun, wind, and tide. I put my money on the sun, solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. That was from 1931. <clears throat> There's been a recent amendment supported by Congressman Roscoe Bartlett of Maryland, Congressman Hank Johnson of Georgia, and Congressman Tom Pateri of Wisconsin to the National Defense Authorization Act for 2013. I greatly appreciate their leadership in this change of language, and this amendment makes an underlying statutory change to the DOD's renewable energy requirement to include direct solar. This would allow the DOD to include daylighting as one of their strategies to become more energy efficient and reduce dependence on foreign oil. We now need the Senate to support this same language, and I encourage you to ask your senator to do so. The potential economic impact 
of the National Daylighting Initiative is staggering. The energy savings from daylighting would greatly reduce the expenditures of companies that utilize this design strategy to eliminate the need for electric lights during the day. This would allow these companies to invest more money in expanding their core business, thus providing more jobs. Daylighting has also been proven to reduce absenteeism, improve morale, and increase productivity. Increased retail sales have also been attributed to daylighting and potentially creating more jobs for those who implement daylighting as a strategy. All these will lead to increased demand for skylights and create green jobs for our industry in design, engineering, production, packaging, and shipping, all leading to growth in the economy and the green jobs ideas. This concept is supported by the great quote from U.S. Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu, the cleanest energy is not solar, geothermal, or wind. It's the energy that is never used at all. Thank you. And I think we all know what a difference it makes in terms of just how we feel when we are surrounded by natural light and, and windows. And we've certainly seen that in work that we've done looking at schools and how kids uh, perform, behave, how it affects the teaching environment um, as well in terms of looking at all those cases. We're now going to hear about yet another piece of this whole efficiency equation. We're going to hear from Les Scott, who is the Director of Business Development for Green Heat. Thank you, Carol. I've been waiting a long time to do this. Uh, the panel lineup of today's section really segues quite well into the green heat mindset of things. Sandwiched between daylighting and its positive effects and LED lighting, you find green heat. Green heat, what is that? Is that uh, bio or it's actually green heat, a warm window system company that utilizes the standard low E glasses that you see prevalent in today's penetration systems and we actually apply an additional component to that typical system. While collaborating <clears throat> with other businesses to effectively take our window systems and create transparent insulation, we're able to use electricity that um, other people would use as just a, uh, a usage and turn that around into something is going to assist in keeping the energy in a building. Transparent insulation and collaborating beyond net zero, the positive net effects of warming windows beyond the R value of adjacent walls. How does a product such as green heat produce something that is, a, is different than a known set value? In other words, how can you take an R5 window and increase its effectiveness by applying another substance to it? We are all in the same energy savings arena. Our companies and the products that we have are, are not net zero by themselves. However, when we collaborate together, the geothermals, the LEDs, the daylighting, we all become a part of that family. While double and triple pane window systems have greatly improved performance, they still have limitations. The calculations for performance are centered around heat loss, not cold gain, but heat loss. What if you could turn that equation around? What if you could have a warm window system operating at nearly net zero, or better yet, a positive heat gain into an occupied space? Although statistical data points to increased daylighting as some of the great source of mental and physical well-being, the popular belief today remains that the trade-off of increased daylighting is increased operating costs. Well, let's think for a moment that Frank DeLubac, the owner of the DeLubac Group of Companies, a company that has for years been involved in uh, ballistic glass and uh, heated glass for refrigeration units. Let's say that uh, that company that's been in business for over 50 years was also involved in hurricane glass, so it's safety glass. Uh, working with the military for blast mitigation and ballistic glass is manufacturing over 500,000 pieces of glass for our Humvees to protect our soldiers in the fighting arenas, saving lives. The Lubeck has been making 
heated glass for over 30 years in refrigerated sections of your grocery stores. Let's say a few years ago, Frank DeLubach was walking through one of those grocery stores looking for his favorite flavor of ice cream. And all of a sudden, it dawned on him. As he reached in and opened the door to that freezer section, he noticed the condensation forming on the interior of that glass. And as he closed it, it disappeared. What if we could do the same thing in a building structure and create a thermal barrier, keeping the warm in and the cold out? Now, obviously, we're not going to uh, target Florida, Arizona, and warmer sections of the country, but let's talk about North Dakota, South Dakota, some of those areas that are uh, typically uh, using heat more than cooling systems. Everyone wants to know, as soon as they, they see the, uh, the effects of our warm window system, well, what can you do for our cooling section? Well, actually, we can help the cooling side of things. The reason we can help the cooling side is we take that same typical makeup of the glass, the R5 windows, the triple panes, and the double panes, and we just improve upon that thereby in, the, in the, uh, the warmer climates, we are still able to use the same effect to help in the, uh, in, in the warm climate. So we can do both, kind of like a thermos, keep cold things cold and warm things warm, just not at the same time. Um, with, with the developments of green heat, we, we actually went and talked to some of the folks at Carnegie Mellon University in uh, Pittsburgh and we've worked in conjunction with uh, an architect there, his name's Eric Fisher. He has actually developed and built and installed a warm window system into his building that he designed with 60% glazing. Their attempt at net zero always fell short because of the 60% glazing until they found out that we could gently warm the glazing up with very little energy. Very little energy. Uh, uh, imagine taking uh, uh, an A-frame home with uh, you know large uh, windows, uh, loft, and uh, you know the fireplace behind you. The first thing you think of when you look out and you see the uh, the frosty mountains out there is how warm is it going to be at the window surface? All right, or well, maybe you think about you know the view first, but I think about how warm it's going to be inside. Typically, those windows are going to be cool. Well, now we can take that same area and gently warm it up. A, an area inside of a, uh, an 1,800-square-foot home in Pennsylvania that I just described as at the A-frame uses less than 500 watts of energy to maintain that 100,000 BTUs inside the building envelope. So we could typically take the, uh, the lighting structure that we have in here and apply that energy to the window system and keep the energy in the building. Now, more daylighting, more energy consumed. That's the traditional mindset. We're trying to flip that equation around by creating more daylighting and using less energy. In a uh, green week um, at uh, a local architect's firm here in D.C. just about three weeks ago, the designer of some of the tallest buildings in the world made this comment. He said that a building is like a solar sponge. Once the energy is brought into the building, you do not want to let it out. You want to keep reusing it for whatever. Um, and, and that was talked about at the, the previous panel. By warming a win window system above the temperature of the adjacent walls and collaborating with other products such as radiant floors and LED lighting and daylighting, we really are able to add more daylighting and use less energy. At this time, I get to say one of the things that I've really wanted to say for a long time. I reserve any time that I've left over for questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, and now we will go to our final speaker for this particular session, uh, to Bruce Salkin, who is the owner of Innovation, Inc., uh, to hear about the whole role of LEDs and lighting. Thank you, Carol. All the other guys covered everything. Thank you. It's been nice to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I've spoken to a few of you out in the uh, in the hall uh, at my uh, exhibit, so you may have heard a bit of what I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, it's kind of a little deja vu. Eric reminded me that I followed him last year on this panel, and uh, I can only repeat what I said then. Um, his concept of daylighting and eliminating electric lights in the daytime is a, a great one. As, as a citizen and a consumer, I would like nothing better than never to have to have a light on during the daytime. Why waste the energy? I mean, if we turn the blinds the other way here and turn the lights off, we'd probably be just fine in this room itself. Um, but there's always nighttime, and uh, we do need light. Uh, and even during the daytime when we're uh, getting the benefit of daylighting, there are places where we still need light. And LED, in my view, is uh, the most efficient light uh, source that we can use today. Uh, is LED a solution for every single uh, environment where light is used and required? No, of course not. But there are many, many applications in LED today uh, that um, uh, all have one thing in common. They save a tremendous amount of energy, and what we're all about is energy efficiency. So uh, as, as I look around this room, um, first of all, in the chandeliers here, we have a couple of different types of light. We have some CFLs that were thrown in up here. Uh, they're a bit more efficient than the incandescents that are in the lights over there. Uh, they actually give off different light, um, and uh, LEDs in their place. Uh, would, uh, would achieve the same level of lighting, the same ambience, because there have been tremendous advances in LED over the last number of years uh, in their ability to control the color temperatures of the light, and et cetera. Um, and uh, simply, you know, I've put a few bullet points down, and one of the things I want to talk about are product types. I'm going to focus on some real uh, real applications and solutions for you folks, whether they be in your businesses uh, or homes or offices, whatever. Um, so LEDs now can be found uh, uh, to replace fluorescent lights, PAR spotlights, recessed down lights, outside uh, lights to wash, uh, wash up the outsides of buildings, street lights. They're both practical and decorative in, in a lot of ways today. Uh, and again, they're Benefit is every one of them saves dramatically. So uh, depending upon what you're replacing, if you're replacing fluorescent lights with LED lights today, your savings will be pretty much across the board a minimum of 45%. You'll be saving uh, on your usage and therefore your expense for electricity. Uh, if you replace uh, metal halide lights with LED lights, uh, depending upon the particular environment, you can save as much as 90% on your usage and your expense. So that starts to add up pretty rapidly. Um, and in these uh, budget conscious times, um, and uh, for those of you who may be involved in, in, uh, in the government here, um, I'm not exactly sure of the details of it, but I know come January 2nd we have some kind of next fiscal crunch or crisis coming, and uh, there's talk of budgets being cut dramatically. Uh, so when you can save 45% to 90% on your energy use, uh, when you can put lights in uh, to fixturing that last five to 10 times longer than the existing lights, uh, you're saving dramatically on your maintenance budget as, uh, as someone I was at one of the embassies in town yesterday, and the facilities manager said to me, see that light up there? I said, yeah, that was out. He said, well, the reason it's out is because to change that $10 light is going to cost me about $250 to bring a maintenance crew in to do that. So uh, when, you can, uh, when you look at the benefit of the long life of LED, uh, there's additional savings there. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the other areas where LED is very, very beneficial in terms of savings is that LEDs run very, very much cooler than traditional lighting, than incandescent lighting or halogen lighting, um, which if ever, any of you have ever touched a halogen light, you know how hot it is. Um, so uh, when LED lights are in place, they require um, an awful lot less HVAC uh, to cool them off. Uh, 
why don't we have LEDs everywhere? Well, the technology has been growing over the last and improving over the last uh, uh, three, four years, ten years, um, and the technologies are are at the place now where a lot of applications for LED are market ready now. The pricing is still high, uh, and um, but the pricing over the last 18 months in particular has started to drop, and ROIs generally are running from three years to less than one year, um, depending upon uh, certain variables. Um, Last but not least, one of the benefits of LED, uh, this is not a particularly energy efficient application, but uh, LED lights contain no mercury. So for those of us who are interested in the environment as well as from a, from a different angle, um, uh, as well as from the, the uh, use of less energy, uh, there of course is that benefit as well. Um, when they're done, they don't go back into uh, the landfill or whatever and, and pollute with more, uh, more mercury. So I'll leave, uh, leave you with those thoughts and questions. Super. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and I know that certainly there are a lot of states and localities that have been moving their street lighting to LEDs because, as you said, of the enormous cost savings and, and improved light quality and the lower maintenance costs in terms of, of uh, crews to maintain that. But another, another issue that I'll never forget several years ago uh, when I met with a, uh, an LED manufacturer, one of the things that um, I saw also firsthand was LEDs in a parking garage. It totally revolutionized the lighting there, and it really is an issue of public safety too in terms of the improved quality. So it's just like one more, one more vantage point. I, I want to say thank you to all of you because one of the exciting things is that I always learn so much from each speaker and everybody who's been here in terms of all of um, the booths. So I hope that you make sure that you talk to everybody and learn as much as possible because if we can get, as everybody's pointed out, how all of these things work together and we put them all together, it's just incredible how we improve so much, really reduce the energy and we can run on clean energy. So thank you very, very much. You were terrific. Thanks. And stay tuned, we've got another panel coming right up.